Good evening, and welcome to the Heterodox History Podcast. Today's presentation, Inventing Pakistan, History of a National Inception. There will be a Q&A session after the presentation. If any audience members have questions to put to me, remember to leave a comment prefaced with at Apostolic Majesty towards the end of the presentation. As the presentation draws to a close, I will send out a reminder. If you wish to guarantee that I will answer your question, please send a super chat. Any donations are greatly appreciated and make the work of this channel possible. Thank you. Why Pakistan? By that I mean, why is Pakistan? And why study its inception, its ascension into nationhood? Discussions around Pakistan's inception cannot avoid mention of India and the belief that Pakistan separated from India, a united India that was divided or partitioned. As a result, the story of partition and the horrors associated with it often eclipses the story of Pakistan's inception outside of Pakistan itself. Indeed, the least serious and the most propagandistic accounts of partition tend to portray India before the British Indian Empire or Raj as a successful multicultural nation rather than a heterogeneous empire or a geographical expression, and partition as the result of Britain's infamous policy of divide and rule, implying an aspect of insincerity to Muslim separatism, separatism that serves as the very antithesis of multiculturalism. As a result, Pakistan is often mentioned in the same breath as Ireland and Israel-Palestine, both territories that were likewise under British rule and were partitioned along sectarian lines with violent consequences. Yet for this presentation, I will avoid lazily buying into this standard and dare I say cliched comparison, which may come as a surprise to many who are used to my more obscure historical analogies. The Protestant Northern Irish or Ulsterman had no desire to create a new nation. Let's call it Protestan, in keeping with the spirit of tonight's topic, but to remain attached to Britain to the extent that their British identity superseded an Irish identity and a strictly Protestant identity. Comparisons between Israel and Pakistan warrant closer inspection. Both were conceived as sectarian states, Israel as Jewish and Pakistan as Muslim. Both nations' borders were, and indeed are, in a state of flux, owing to constant wars with neighbours who represent some form of antithesis. At points in more recent history, this fact has converged with the respective foreign policies of India and the Arab world. Yet here the similarities with Israel and by extension Zionism cease. Zionism looked toward the reclamation of a specific territory with a national precedent in antiquity. Pakistan is no Judea, as Islamabad is no Jerusalem, for Pakistan is neither the Muslim holy land nor the Muslim home state. It is something else. To quote Aisha Halal and all of the reading sections I have down in the description if you want to look into those, Pakistan proclaiming itself an Islamic state created on the bedrock of a non-territorially defined Muslim nation or Ummah, the architects of Pakistan embrace the idea of the nation state without conceding space to territorial nationalism in their official ideology. In opposition to united Hindu majority India, Pakistan was not reclaimed, but invented, and arguably out of necessity. I may cover the specific events of partition from all perspectives at a later date. Indeed, to do so here as the tail end to a conceptual history of Pakistan and from the purely Pakistani perspective would do the subject a disservice. Pakistan as a concept is unique as it is paradoxical. It challenges the idea that a state is determined by its geography or arbitrary lines on the map. It at once represents a particularistic rebellion, a centrifugal or decentralizing force of regional, linguistic and religious identity acting against secularism and centralization. Conversely, a new Pakistani identity had to be imposed to override those very tendencies that centered opposition to United India. 
Thus, Pakistan presents a conundrum, defining a nation in the abstract or conceptual realm only to be confronted by the realities of nation building and national survival. Pakistan, moreover, is a testament to the great man theory of history. It is impossible to consider the creation of Pakistan without the charismatic personality of Muhammad Ali Jinnah. As such, Mr. Jinnah will be a central element of this presentation. The boundaries of a projected united India, save for Portuguese, Dieu, Daman and Goa, or French India, including the provinces of Pondicherry, etc., were the boundaries of the Raj, the British administered territories and dependencies, the princely states. Britain did not conquer an already existing united Indian state, quite the contrary. Clive conquered the province of Bengal in the 1750s from the autonomous governor of a rapidly receding Mughal empire, beginning Britain's rapid ascension towards paramountcy over the subcontinent. Neither the Mughals or any preceding foreign or indigenous empire successfully conquered or united the entire subcontinent. Thus, the prospect of a united India was only made possible by the British, and what is often characterized as an independent struggle relied not on dismantling the Raj, but on ensuring an element of government continuity through the transfer of power from a British elite to an Indian elite. Indeed, India was a dominion of the British Empire before becoming a republic. In addition to India's historic political disunity, the subcontinent was, and is, religiously and ethnically heterogeneous. Ancient India was the origin point for Hinduism, Jainism, and Buddhism. This heterogeneity was represented in the makeup of ancient India's various empires. Ashoka, the greatest of the Mayan emperors, was a Buddhist ruling over a majority Hindu empire. The peoples of the north are mainly grouped together as Indo-Aryan, whereas in the south, they are mainly Dravidian. This ethnic division, linguistic division, is demarcated by geography. Before the Muslim invasions, various northern Indian empires, shown here, were centered on the city of Pataliputra, modern-day Patna on the Ganges. The Ganges and the Indus River basins, the Indo-Gangetic plain, providing for the natural borders of Hindustan, which is the Persian rendering of the land of the Indians, not the land of the Hindus. Successive Dravidian empires were centered on both the Deccan Plateau and the southeastern coastline, as was the case with the Chola Empire, which had extensive cultural and trade links with Malaysia and modern-day Indonesia. The last great empire from Pataliputra, the Gupta Empire, collapsed in part from the pressure of Hunnic raiders from Central Asia. Into the power vacuum left in the Northwest came the Umayyads, who established emirates in Sindh and later Multan, the first presence of a Muslim state on the modern territory of Pakistan. After the fall of the Umayyads and the decline of their successor state, the Abbasids, Central Asia and Iran fell under the control of Turkic dynasties who launched raids into India. One such dynasty, the Ghaznavids, conquered the upper Indus River Valley and would later establish themselves in the city of Lahore while conducting raids as far as Mathura, one of the richest cities of 11th century India. These raids coincided with the destruction of Buddhist and Hindu holy sites. The Guru dynasty in the 12th century went further, establishing Muslim control over Hindustan, ceding the foundations of the Delhi Sultanate. Until the 13th century, Emir Khalji, the Muslim, uh, under, under the 13th century Emir Khalji, the Muslims conquered Bengal, while also coinciding with an intensification of attacks on Hindus and Buddhists, in particular Hindu idols and Buddhist priests. Bengal was established as a Muslim-dominated state until Clive's victory for the British at the Battle of Plassey in 1758. The Delhi Sultanate will continue to expand into southern India, reaching its zenith in the 14th century, before fragmenting into a number of regional Muslim power centers, from Baidar and the Deccan to Bengal, exporting a Persianate culture across the subcontinent. As Muslim rule transferred from semi-nomadic tributary empires into sedentary states, Muslim rulers and their Persian-speaking courts were tasked with ruling over their majority Hindu subjects. 
Throughout the 13th and 14th centuries, there had been earnest attempts to convert as well as conquer India. Periodically, temples were desecrated and their wealth expropriated, which helped fund future campaigns. The last of the great Delhi sultans, Firoz Shah, attempted to impose Sharia throughout his domain, which coupled with his over-reliance and dependency on the aristocracy, facilitated the rapid decline of the Sultanate after his death. The remaining Muslim potentates began extending privileges of worship to Hindus, nominally only afforded to Jews and Christians as Dimi, or the protected groups, in exchange for payment of the jizya, the religious tax. As the central authority of Delhi waned, its rulers opted for a system of paramountcy, where local Hindu elites would show deference to the Sultan, though exercising virtual autonomy. The rule of the Delhi Sultans was not overthrown by a patriotic Hindu uprising, but by a new Muslim power under Timur, also known as Tamerlane, and his successors. Timur sacked Delhi in 1400. Timur's descendant Babur defeated the last of the Delhi sultans at the Battle of Panipat in 1526, establishing the Mughal Empire, which under Akbar would control the entirety of northern India, subjugating the famously independent Rajput princes. Following the Delhi tradition of paramountcy, local Hindu rulers such as the Rajput Raja of Amber would submit to and even intermarry with the Mughals. Under Aurangzeb, Mughal power extended throughout the Deccan to encompass nearly the entirety of the Indian subcontinent. As with Firoz Shah, Aurangzeb imposed Sharia law throughout India and spent decades of his reign contesting a Hindu guerrilla insurgency of the Marathas under Shivaji. At the time of Aurangzeb's death in 1707, the empire was exhausted and bereft of talented and loyal leaders. The Maratha insurgency grew into a dominant confederacy of princes across Western India, while Mughal provinces such as the Subar Bengal achieved independence from Delhi in all but name. Amid the tumult of 18th century India, the Mughals began targeting Sikh temples in the Punjab. Sikhism came to be in the Punjab at the beginning of the 16th century, around Babur's victory at Panipat, in opposition to both Hinduism and Islam. By the 18th century, the Sikh community, or Khalsa, was in a position to challenge Muslim authority in the Punjab, and by the 19th century, had established a Sikh empire in Punjab and Kashmir. The Sikh empire was one of the last Indian states to defy British authority. By the close of the 18th century, the Mughal emperors ruled over Delhi, and only Delhi. However, the legitimacy associated with paramountcy remained, and the Marathas and the British East India Company competed for control over the Emperor of India until the last Mughal Emperor was implicated in supporting the Sepoy Rebellion against the British, resulting in the definite end of the Mughal Empire. Britain obtained total paramountcy. The East India Company provinces were transferred to the British Crown, and in 1876, Queen Victoria was made Empress of India, confirming the status of the British Indian Empire, or Raj, under a Crown-appointed Viceroy. The Muslims in India, more than representing a significant religious minority within the Raj, were the heirs of the Mughal emperors and the Delhi sultans, who together with the various Muslim princes and sultans had collectively dominated India for 650 years before the definitive conquest by the British. Their influence had left an indelible mark on Indian culture, from the Persian-Hindi hybrid language of Urdu, Indian Sufism, which represented elements of a Muslim Indian syncretism, and not least in the most recognizable Mughal architectural monument, the Taj Mahal. Indeed, this temporal power of Indian Muslims continued to be represented via the princely states, the largest of which, Hyderabad, was ruled by a Muslim Nawab. Why then would Muslims defy the creation of a united India and insist on their own independent state? I'm going to read a section from Omar Prakash's Roots of Islamic Separatism in the Indian Subcontinent. I do have some minor issues with the journal, the Proceedings of the Indian History Congress. Uh, they have a lot of typos, but um, bear with me as I read through some segments. According to the Quran and the Islamic, the Islamic State is based on three elements. One holy book, Quran, one nation, the Millet or Muslim Brotherhood, and one sovereign, the Halif. 
So the idea that all Muslims worldwide form one nation is enshrined in Islam itself. But it was in the second half of the 19th century that this concept was popularized that Hindus and Muslims form not only two nations, but also two warring nations. By the close of the 19th century, minuscule Western educated elite class among the Muslims had emerged. This class took the initiative of creating an awareness of education among the masses, much before the efforts made by Syed Ahmad Khan in this direction. The inability to form a middle class, their relative backwardness, and scramble for government services were some of the other reasons for the rise of Muslim separatism in India. English education had primarily benefited Hindus, while Muslims in general remained indifferent to the English education system because they perceived danger of Christianity to their religion. They termed the education department office as the Shaitani Daftar. Syed Ahmad Khan understood the existing reality and he emphasized the issue of the education of the Muslims. The Aligar College produced graduates who filled the vacancies in government offices normally reserved for the Muslims. So Syed's role needs to be contextualized in the aftermath of the 1857 Sepoy Rebellion, a phase when politically conscious Muslims, mostly belonged to higher echelons of the society, felt insecure in the wake of the loss of sovereignty, especially the collapse of the Mughal Empire and emergence of a foreign power with clear imperial designs. Somehow, this feeling developed into a atmosphere or a paranoia that the Hindus prefer the British rule over that of the Mughals. Thus, an idea of Hindu domination over the Muslims slowly developed. Thus, the political consciousness, um, conscious Muslims sought to preserve their separate identity. Not surprisingly, in the 1860s, Syed Ahmad Khan began advocating for the relevance of Muslim education. He approached the commissioner of Banaras, Mr. Shakespeare in 1867 for this purpose. The commissioner responded, this is the first occasion when I have heard you speak about the progress of Muslims alone. Before this, you were keen about the welfare of your countrymen in general. To this, Syed Ahmed Khan replied, now I'm convinced that both these nations will not join wholeheartedly in anything. At present, there is no open hostility between the two communities, but on account of the so-called educated people, it will increase immediately in future. In fact, these words affirmed a British strategy of using Muslims as instruments in fomenting divisive policies. In terms of this idea which Prakash is using about affirmation of British strategy of using Muslims as instruments of fomenting divisive policies, again, it's leading into this idea of the formation of Pakistan as a result of the British policy of divide and rule, but at the same time, the writer of this, Om Prakash, is very hostile to the notion of Islam, and it comes out a bit later in the article, which I'm not going to cover because it's not worth covering. But nevertheless, it's interesting to consider how many educated Brits and indeed um, educated people from the entire empire contributed to this sense of both Hindu nationalism, Muslim nationalism, and a collective sense of secular Indian nationalism. So whilst, again, we're talking about ill intent on the British on one hand, there does seem to be a genuine enthusiasm from below, from individual participants or subjects of the British Empire. How and why did Syed Ahmed Khan start drifting from nationalism to separatism? In the early 1860s, the Hindus of Banaras were demanding that Hindi and the Devnagari or the Brahmic script ought to replace Urdu and Persian in courts and government institutions in the United Provinces. The United Provinces being the, you can say, the most important province in terms of the Muslim consolidation of power, that being the area around Agra and Delhi, the two centers of Mughal authority. This kind of disregard of Muslim sentiments by Hindu commu um, communisms was a turning point in Syed Ahmed's thinking, who had so far believed in communal harmony. I have often said that India is like a bride, whose two eyes are the Hindus and the Muslims. Her beauty consists in that her two eyes be of equal luster. Slaughtering cow for the purpose of annoying Hindus is the height of cantankerous folly. But when my Hindu brothers and Bengali friends devise such a course of action as will bring us loss and heap disgrace on our nation, then indeed we can no longer remain friends. 
Without doubt, it is our duty to protect our nation from those attacks of the Hindus and the Bengalis. The establishment of the Mohammedan Anglo Oriental College at Alagarh in 1875, although meant to provide Western education to Muslims, soon became a breeding ground for the growth of separatist sentiments. Its establishment was hailed by the British in the words of Coupland. It marked the turning of the tide, the end of the decline, and the beginning of the recovery. He also forbade the Muslims from joining the Indian National Congress. In a speech in 1883, Ahmed Khan asserted, now suppose that the English were to leave India, then who would be the rulers of India? It is possible that under the, cir under the circumstances, the two, nation, um, the two nations, the Muslims and the Hindus, could sit on the same throne and remain equal to power? Most certainly not. It is necessary that one of them should conquer the other and thrust it down. To hope that both could equal is to desire the impossible and the inconceivable. Syed Ahmad Khan opposed the British attempt of introducing representative institutions for he thought the conditions in India and England were entirely different and it would only invite trouble in India, stating, India as a continent in itself is inhabited by vast populations of different races and creeds. The rigor or religious institutions has kept even neighbors apart. The system of caste is still dominant and powerful. In one and the same district, the population may consist of various creeds and various nationalities. And whilst one section of the population commands wealth and commerce, the other may possess learning and influence. One section may be numerically larger than the other, and the standard of enlightenment which one section of the community has reached may be far higher than that attained by the rest of the population. One community may be fully alive, to the importance of securing representation on the local boards and the district councils, whilst be wholly indifferent to such matters, whilst another be wholly indifferent to such matters. In such circumstances, any conditions, and under these conditions, it is hardly possible to deny that the introduction of representative institutions in India will be attended with considerable difficulty and socio-political risk. In order to impose the policies of Congress, he organized the All Indian Anti-Congress Organization of Muslim Landlords. Likewise, he formed the United Patriotic Association, along with Raja Sittap, Roya Banaras, the similar objective to oppose, not only oppose the policies of the Indian National Congress, but also to support colonial rule, in a speech he gave on December 28, 1887, at the Lucknow annual session of the Mohammedan Education Conference, his position was quite clear. Now let us imagine the, Vic the Viceroy's Council made in this manner that all the Muslim electors vote for a Muslim member and all the Hindu vote for a Hindu member. And now count how many votes the Muslim members will have. It is certain that the Hindu members will have four times as many because their population is four times as numerous. Therefore, we can prove by mathematics that there will be four votes for the Hindu to every vote for the Muslim. And now how can the Muslim guard his interests? His fear of Hindu domination was so great that he wished, in part, for the perpetuation of some form of paramountcy or British rule in India. It is therefore necessary that for the peace of India and for the progress of everything in India, the English government should remain for many years, if not forever. I do not understand what the word National Congress means. It is supposed that the different castes and creeds living in India belong to one nation or can become a nation. I think it quite impossible. And when it is impossible, there can be no such thing as a national congress, nor can it be of equal benefit to all peoples. Syed Ahmed Khan on the Indian National Congress. Thanks to remarks such as this, Khan is often, in my view erroneously, conflated with the two nation theory that there, may, there must be a majority Hindu and a majority Muslim nation in a post-independence India. Rather, the two-nation theory crystallized as the prospect of independence from Britain became inevitable. By contrast, Khan was the defender of the Raj, and as such Indian independence, whatever that meant, was anathema to the King Emperor's loyal Mohammedans. Far from desiring the creation of an independent Indian Muslim Ummah or nation, Khan believed that the protection of India's Muslims was contingent on the continu continuation of paramountcy, India's traditional, heterogeneous, non-democratic, 
social hierarchy with a non-Hindu head. If that non-Hindu head happened to be the British sovereign, so be it, rather than succumb to a Hindu majority government. Muslim advocacy at this early stage in the Raj is best described as reactionary rather than revolutionary. The protection of an extant Muslim Ummah or nation within the Raj, not an appeal to Muslim statehood. Similar to the Ottoman Millet system. As such, Khan believed the preservation of the status quo was the preferred solution. Nevertheless, the viability of paramountcy as a solution for India's Muslims waned as Britain represented an imperial and a democratic ideal in tandem, a contradiction that would help doom the Raj. The Indian National Congress, India's premier independence party, embraced a democracy, and with it, the possibility of Hindu majority rule over United India would further inflame Hindu Muslim relations. But what was the Indian National Congress? Rather than overindulge a view which lumps Muslims and Hindus into separate and indivisible categories, Congress represented, and indeed continues to claim, a broad church membership, which included prominent Muslim advocates for independence and Hindu-Muslim unity, such as Abdul Kalam Azhad and Basha Khan. Among the party's membership was Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the founder of Pakistan. Congress was conceived in 1883 and founded in 1885 as an elite Indian lobby group under the auspices of a former imperial civil servant, Alan Hume, with the consent of the then Viceroy, Viceroy Lord Deferin. The Congress had links with the UK Liberal Party through the Baronet Vedderburn, Congress President, and Dadabai Naroji, an MP in the UK Parliament, dubbed the unofficial ambassador of India. The nature of the Congress and the relationship between India's Hindus and Muslims fundamentally changed when Viceroy Curzon partitioned the province of Bengal in 1905. The partition established a Muslim-dominated East Bengal centered in Dhaka, the capital of modern-day Bangladesh, curtailing the regional dominance of Hindu Calcutta, which was then the capital of British India. The backlash from the Hindu majority Congress to the partition was so great that it spawned the All India Muslim League in Dhaka in reaction. Many of the League's political agitators were drawn from Syed Ahmed Khan's Aligarh University. As a result of the partition, moderates in Congress, such as Gokhale, were sidelined by figures such as Rashtaguru, who promoted the idea of Indian home rule, extending Congress from an elite lobby into a popular movement. Jinnah was a member of this Gokhale faction of moderates who opposed agitation and believed that Indian self-government could be achieved via constitutional means. Jinnah was himself a successful barrister, a Muslim representative in the powerless Imperial Legislative Council. Despite being a Muslim, Jinnah was an early opponent of the All India Muslim League and one of its founders, Agu Khan, arguing that the elite league did not represent India's Muslims, let alone a separate Muslim nation within India, as Aga Khan would claim. So impotent was the league that Curzon's successor as viceroy, the Earl of Minto, acquiesced to Congress and repealed the partition of Bengal. After Aga Khan stepped down as the leader of the Muslim League, Jinnah joined for the express purpose of fostering Hindu-Muslim unity in Congress, as exemplified through the Lucknow Pact. Jinnah met Gandhi, who had already established himself as a successful proponent of non-violent resistance in South Africa. Upon returning to India, Gandhi became the spiritual leader of Congress and pioneered Satyagraha, or Truth Force, a non-violent form of political agitation for independence. While Gandhi's star in Congress rose, Jinnah's dwindling faction in Congress was affected by the loss of Gokhale, after which Jinnah became the leader of the Muslim League. Despite this, the First World War and its immediate aftermath marked a brief instance of sincere Hindu-Muslim cooperation. Jinnah supported the war, believing that enthusiastic Indian participation would ensure Indian status as a British self-governing dominion. These hopes would be denied and sympathy for Indian independence intensified after the Amritsar massacre. Rather than achieving full home rule, India received very limited rights to political representation through the Montague-Chelmsford reforms. 
after Amritsar, Gandhi successfully positioned himself as India's independence leader, appealing to both Muslims and Hindus through his support of the pan-Islamic advocacy group for the Ottoman Caliph, a spiritual leader of India's Muslims, the Caliphate movement. Rather than endearing himself to Jinnah, Gandhi's actions, coupled with his personal dress and ascetic lifestyle, convinced Jinnah that Congress was being transformed from a secular into a religious movement, and as a religious movement, a religiously motivated and zealous Hindu majority would always overcome a religiously zealous Muslim minority. Moreover, Jinnah denounced Satyagraha in the same vein, believing that Gandhi was inciting anarchy. When the Congress endorsed Gandhi, Jinnah left the Congress, returning to his law practice in England, though remaining as the Muslim League's nominal leader. Though Congress had failed to achieve Indian independence, the movement went from strength to strength under new leaders such as Nehru, adopting an ambitious plan for a united India that would see the eradication of differences between caste, ethnicity and religion. In 1928, the Simon Commission arrived in India to consider the reform of the Indian government. To the Muslim League's horror, Nehru's prepared re report for reform, which would mean dominion status for India, established a unitary state, a uniform writing system based on the Devanagari Brahmi script, and reserved representation for Muslims that would only amount to a quarter of seats in parliament. In response, Jinnah composed his 14 points or constitutional amendments. He emphasized the need for guaranteed Muslim governmental and parliamentary representation together with a federal government for India, where India's states would have autonomy. In essence, Jinnah was for now a proponent of a united India with a weak centre, in contrast to the strong centre as advocated by Nehru. Nehru rejected these plans as, quote, ridiculous, to which Jinnah declared a definitive schism in the independence movement, a parting of the ways. Jinnah finally returned to active Indian politics in 1934. As a result of the Simon Commission and the Round Table Conferences in the early 1930s, a new Government of India bill was framed, establishing a federal framework for India, which empowered provinces, a proposal which the Muslim League reluctantly accepted, as representing a form of the weak centre, which Jinnah had envisioned. In the event, Jinnah's prolonged absence and the League's inactivity, in comparison to the organization and preparation of Nehru's Congress, resulted in an overwhelming Congress victory in India's provincial elections. The League failed to win a majority in any of the provinces, including Muslim-majority provinces. For the League, it was both a demonstration of Muslim political disunity and proof that in any Indian democratic regime, the Muslims would constitute a permanent opposition. In response to this trauma, Muslim political action in India underwent a dramatic transformation. Here it is pertinent to discuss the ideological origins of, Muslim, of the Muslim League's metamorphosis through the politics and poetry of Sir Muhammad Iqbal, one of the leading lights in Congress uh, in, in the League during Jinnah's prolonged absence. And here I'm reading a segment from V. N. Datta's Iqbal Jinnah and India's Partition and Intimate Relationship. In Pakistani historiography, Iqbal is often represented as the founding and spiritual father of Pakistan. In many Indian writings, on the other hand, he is projected as a firm and convinced Muslim nationalist. While in other works, he emerges as a champion of Hindu-Muslim solidarity and freedom of India, and a unique symbol of India's composite culture, fostered and sustained through the centuries. For Muhammad Mujib Ali Zahid Jafri, Yagan Nath Azad, and Kushwant Singh, the question remained whether Iqbal was a poet of Muslim separatism. And that fact was ultimately irrelevant, for their principal interest in Iqbal lies in his. Um, <laughs> sorry, I have to repeat the section. Too many. Um, I, I do. I do apologize regarding the the general pronunciations, but the general gist of the article is focusing on the historiography pertaining to Iqbal as a poet first, or Iqbal as a politician. And what this article, what Data is trying to do, is say that these concepts are inseparable, and to separate them is fundamentally erroneous. Indeed, Iqbal was an outstanding Persian Urdu poet. His reading was extensive his mind fertile and vigorous, and his style rising at times to solemn eloquence, reflecting boundless creative energy 
audacity of spirit. His sense of language was original and unparalleled, yet we cannot disengage Iqbal's poetry from his political ambitions and aspirations. In the early part of his life, until Iqbal went to Cambridge in 1905, his poetry was imbued with a burning passion for Indian nationalism and its heterogeneous culture. Unlike his contemporaries, his identification with Indian culture, religious and history was quite spontaneous, intense and broad. His poems express his eclectic outlook, his respect for Hindu gods and Sikh religious leaders, and his profound feelings for the rivers, the hills and the landscape of India. By drawing upon Hindu, Muslim and Sikh traditions and symbols, Iqbal in these years emerges as a leading Indian poet. In his Song of India, he extolled the glories of his Hindustan. Our country is the greatest in the world. We are her nightingales and she our gardener. Religion doesn't preach rift. We are Indians and our country is India. Greece, Rome and Egypt are no more, yet we continue to flourish. Something within us makes our existence worthy of note. Though unsmiling fortune has been our enemy. Iqbal described Rama, the popular incarnation of Vishnu or avatar of Vishnu as the embodiment of perfection or Dharma, as a Iman Ehind, the religious leader of India. India is proud of Rama. The wise revere him as a spiritual guide. Likewise, Iqbal considered Guru Nanak as the perfect man. Uh, Guru Nanak, of course, was the first of the Sikh gurus. Taking pride in his own Brahmin ancestry, he wrote, Look at me. You will never find another in India. Who, like me, a Brahmin's son, understands the secrets of Arabs and Persia? In the new temple, a harmonious blend of Shakti, power, and Bhakti, worship, he eloquently summed up the message of the Bhavgada Gita. Power and peace are the songs of a devotee. Love is the ultimate for humankind. In the same poem, Iqbal declared his unsullied commitments to his homeland and its cultural symbols. For me, every particle of my country is a deity. One of his poems, Aftab, was a loose rendering of the Gayatari mantra for which a Muslim cleric prepared a fatwa against him. O oh, son, stimulate our mental faculties with your glorious light. Give us wisdom by your divine light. After his return from Europe in 1908, Iqbal was a changed man. He acquired a new world view. He began to reflect on religious issues in the wake of the European aggression against the Muslim countries, including Turkey and Persia. To face the Western challenge, he, like his contemporaries, Assad, the Ali brothers, Muhammad and Shak and Hashrat Mahani, advocated pan-Islamism as the political goal of the Islamic world. He began to regard himself as Islam's messenger, the Shia Islam, and his poetry became a vehicle of Islamic thought. It was in these years that Iqbal adopted the posture of a fervent preacher, a nasi, in its poetical compositions. His poetry was to serve as a moral guide, a shaper of the individual, and by extension, a community's conduit. He warned, if the purpose of poetry is the fashioning of men, poetry is likewise the heir of prophecy. The poet is like the heart in the breast of the community. A people without a poet is mere heap of clay. Galib never pontificated. His most serious thoughts were expressed irreverently and rather spontaneously. After 1908, Iqbal's poetry gradually acquired a high moral tone and carried a clear communitarian message. Therein, perhaps, lay his originality. Iqbal did not emulate the lyrical charm of Mir Takimir or Galeb's acute sense of exalted humanism. Instead, he acknowledged his intellectual de debt to Altaf Hussein Hali, the poet of the Islamic Renaissance, for inspiring him to compose poetry for the moral regeneration of the fallen Muslim community. I am a model for composing poetry, but I echo Halil's voice. Again, link this back to the idea of Syed Ahmed Khan and his promotion of the Urdu language and defense of the speaking of Persian and Urdu as the court and the language of administration in India. I take this back to the idea of representing some form 
of Islamic Renaissance or the regeneration of a fallen Muslim community. In the case of Syed Ahmed Khan, this was to be pursued through the patronage of Muslim institutions for education. And with Iqbal, it is to be expressed in poetry and, of course, combine poetry with political action. I am a model for composing poetry, but I echo Halil's voice. In particular, his poems, The Complaint, composed in 1911, and the answer to the complaint in 1912 were clearly inspired by Halil's um, Masada's Akbar al-Habadi, who had exhorted Muslims to lead a pure life and to prepare themselves to protect their cultural identity. This also influenced him greatly. Emphasis on Muslims leading a pure life, and we'll link back to that later. Islamic principles of dynastic righteousness and social action were not mere poetic or oh, contemplative, um, co contemplative images for Iqbal. They became a medium of integrating and consolidating Muslims as a strong pan-Islamic community inspired by the highest ideals of truth, love, and justice. He expressed the finest values of Islam in his powerful poetic rhetoric of inspiring Muslims cons to consolidate themselves as a community. Often in his poetry, Iqbal anatomized his p piteous spectacle of the Muslim community, its moral um, degeneration, its false idols and its hypocrisies. In anguish, he cried in Saki Nama, the fire of life is dead. It is not a Muslim, but a heap of dust. In Shikva, he argued with God for favoring the non-Muslims. Kindness is bestowed not on the Muslims, but on the non-Muslims while the Muslims continue to suffer. Iqbal waxed lyrical over Muslim conquest and domination. There is an expression of aggressive communitarian nationalism in the following lines. China and Arabia are ours. Hindustan is ours. We have grown to mankind under the shadow of the sword. The dagger-like crescent is our national symbol. The valleys of the West resonated with our call to prayer. Nobody could stem the swelling tide of our conquerors. The prophet is our leader. His name gives us peace and tranquility. Let me tell you what is the destiny of a nation. The sword and the dagger take precedence over singing and dancing. If I seek death, I seek death in the holy land of Hejaz. Hejaz obviously being the site of the twin cities Mecca and Medina. In the call of the caravan bell, the secrets of the self and the mysteries of selflessness, Iqbal expressed his commitment to Muslim sentiments and beliefs. In his Mashid Qutaba, Cordova, um, in Gabriel's Wing, which equates to Milton's Paradise Lost, Iqbal harps on the glory of Islam and Muslim conquest that had led to the expansion of Muslim dominion in the world. For him, Islamic idiom was a powerful medium for inspiring Muslim communities and forging a modern Muslim identity. He realized that the concept of self-realization embodied in the Quran was an essential element for the moral and spiritual uplift of the Muslim society. When Mulana Hussein Ahmed Batni, Sheikh Ul Madas, president of the Jamatul Ulama e Hind, exhorted Hindus and Muslims at the Bara Hindu Rao in Delhi on January the 9th, 1938, to sink their differences and join together in their fight against British imperialism, emphasizing that nations were formed by countries, Iqbal contested this view sarcastically and retorted that religion was the foundation of nationality. In a satirical vein, in his poem Hussein Ahmed, he wrote, non-Arabian countries do not know what true faith is. A strange interpretation of true faith from Hussein Ahmed of Deoband. He declares that countries make nations. How ignorant is he of the message of the prophet, who is the true source of religion. Thus, according to Iqbal, Islam was a single, unanalyzable reality, and its separation from politics was unjustified. He rejected the Western idea of territorial nationalism as a byproduct of the perversion of Western democracy and developed an entwined notion of Muslim nationalism, Islamic universalism, as a common basis of action. Iqbal's passionate commitment to Islamic universalism, his notion of separate Muslim identity and citizenship, and his complete disregard of territorial nationalism provide a sound clue to an understanding of his political conduct. 
his poetic energies and his political leanings increasingly came under the shadow of an Islamic framework. Iqbal himself did not take any active part in politics until 1927. Though he expounded the notion of a millet and exhorted Muslims to follow the tenets of Islam to consolidate themselves as a community. Essentially, he was a poet, not a politician, but he was a poet with a difference. In these years, he turned into a poet philosopher, inspiring a generation of people through a powerful message of community, regeneration and self-confidence. In the 1920s and the 1930s, the Muslim League, torn by factionism, was an upper class party of the landed gentry. The party was almost at death's door, depending on the munificence of the Raja of Mohammedabad and a few other individuals. When the All Indian Muslim League session took place in Lahore in 1920, Iqbal did not care to attend it, even though the meeting was held at the Gulab Theatre, just opposite his residence. Never before had the communal question assumed such dangerous dimensions in the country as it did in the 1920s, after the Caliphate movement and non-cooperation movements had heralded an era of Hindu-Muslim fraterni fraternization. Between 1923 and 26, there were as many as 72 communal riots against 16 in the course of 20 years from 1900. The Hindu-Muslim problem, Mohandas Gandhi announced in March 1925, was an insoluble puzzle, and he would keep out of it. He took to fast and saw no light to resolve the communal question. Despite a number of unity conferences, political parties were unable to cure the communal canker. The Nehru Report, published in 1928, accepted dominion status as its goal, but found no favor with the Muslim League and the All India Muslim Conference. The Nehru Report had recommended the abolition of separate electorates, the reservation of seats and weightages for Muslims in provinces in which they constituted a majority. These recommendations were made on the assumption that Muslim interests were protected by the principle of provincial autonomy. Weighted heavily in favor of a strong center, the constitution that the Nehru report recommended could hardly be called federal. Understandably, Muslim reactions against the Nehru report were strong. The appointment of the Simon Commission split the Muslim League into two factions, one led by Shafi, the other by Jinnah. In 1929, Iqbal joined the Shafi faction. For four years, he was a member of the Punjab Legislative Council, and in 1930, the president of the Punjab Muslim League. Jinnah came to an agreement with the president of the Congress in 1927, which guaranteed Muslims 33% of the seats in the central legislature, a separation of Sindh from Bombay, and reforms in Baluchistan, the northwestern frontier. At this stage, Jinnah was willing to give up the demand for separate electorates. Initially, the Congress Working Committee welcomed the Delhi proposals, but later rejected them. Mohammad Shafi, Mian Fazel Hussain, and Iqbal also repudiated this agreement. Iqbal felt that provincial legislatures could not protect Muslims under the existing constitutional provisions and therefore required drastic changes. During 1928-29, to 29, Iqbal delivered six lectures under the auspices of the Madras Muslim Association, which were published as the Reconstruction of Religious Thought in Islam. In these lectures, he offered a rational interpretation of Islam explored its philosophical basis and regarded it as consistent with modern philosophy and science. He believed the teaching of Islam advocated a meliorism. It recognized the importance of the growing universe and was dynamic and flexible enough to adapt itself to the current needs of thought and thought of modern times. By giving a rational interpretation of the Quran, he reinterpreted some of the essential Islamic legal principles. He urged Muslims to model their social life in the light of ultimate principles, as revealed in the Islamic ideals. Almost Janus-like, Iqbal had one face towards the past in the recovery of the essence of Islam, and another towards the future that looked ahead by projecting a Faustian vision of unlimited power and the concept of man, bent on a ceaseless quest for apprehending reality. Condemning traditional or obscurantist Islam, Iqbal gave legitimacy to the political cause of Muslim nationalism. Because of his profound reverence for Islamic tradition and symbols, he upheld Sharia as the guiding principle of Muslim polity and society. He sought to revive a dynamic and radical element within Islam by restoring the freedom to use ishihad, 
a means of exercising independent judgment as a necessary instrument of Muslim politics. But on specific issues, especially those relating to women, whom he wanted to lead a pure life in subjugation to men, and the Islamic restriction of eating and drinking, he had conservative views. In the closing chapter of the Oxford edition of his book, he warned the reformers against moving too fast in introducing radical changes in the old institutions and practices followed in Muslim countries. Clearly, Iqbal was opposed to the idea of territorial nationalism. In his concept of the state, the spiritual and the temporal issues were inseparable. Islam was a theocracy that realized the spiritual in the human organization. He doubted if a non-Muslim legislative assembly could exercise this use of ijihad. These principles form the ideological basis of the presidential address that he delivered at the Muslim League session held in Allahabad in 1930. Here he propounded his theory of a Muslim homeland, though ambiguously so. He felt that the Nero Report and the Simon Commission recommendations had denied the Muslims their legitimate political rights. He expressed his desire to free Muslims from the geographical limits hitherto imposed by the British government and spoke in favour of a separate area for the protection of a separate Muslim cultural identity. The life of Islam as a cultural force depends on its sorry just give me a second having a bit of a problem the protection of a separate muslim cultural identity the life of islam as a cultural force depends on its centralization in a specific territory he realized the threat posed by hindu majoritarianism in muslim culture and to muslim cultural identity he criticized the Lucknow Pact of 1916, the crowning achievement of Muhammad Ali Jinnah for reducing Muslims to a religious minority, a notion that Jinnah drastically modified later in his presidential address to the Muslim League in Lahore in 1940. In his address, Iqbal also attacked the scheme of Punjab ruralism, the sheet anchor of the Unionist Party for reducing the Muslim majority to a minority in Punjab. The Unionist Party had been elected as the largest party in Punjab in the 1937 provincial elections. Iqbal gave a blueprint for resolving the communal problem, which had acquired an insidious character in the 1920s. He said, I would like to see the Punjab, the northwest frontier, the Afghan province, Sindh and Baluchistan amalgamated into a single state self-government within the British Empire or without the British Empire. The formation of a consolidated Northwest Indian Muslim state appears to me the final destiny of the Muslims, at least for the Northwest of India. This state was conceived to be exclusive of the Ambala division and other areas where non-Muslims predominated. He also opposed the inclusion of Indian native states in the nominal federation as recommended by the Simon Commission. Reginald Copeland, an imperial constitutional historian, thought that Iqbal's proposals for a separate Muslim state in India, couched in an ambiguous language, were susceptible to various interpretations. He did not contemplate a separate sovereign Muslim state, but only a northwest autonomous Muslim re religion compri um, comprising the Muslim majority areas within a loose All India Federation, but excluding Indian states and exercising only those powers expressly vested in it by a free consent of the federal states, almost like a Indian equivalent of the European Union. Iqbal's writings form the ideological basis for a Muslim self-governing union or state, either within a federal India or a continuation of the Raj with the British Empire or without it. The need for a weak center overriding the desire for Indian independence. We observe in Iqbal an assertion of Muslim regional identity and autonomy vis-a-vis -vis India, emphasizing Punjab, Sindh, Baluchistan, and the Northwest frontier as a prospective union. Geopolitically, there was a logic in a union of the Northwestern provinces to form the basis of a contiguous state or a state within a state, a logic that is represented in the dual etymology of the word Pakistan itself. However, Iqbal did not coin the term Pakistan. Writing in Cambridge in 1932, Shodhari Ramat Ali devised Pakistan and published it a year later with an explicit demand for Pakistani statehood rather than autonomy within an all India federation. From Ali's Pakistan declaration, 
at this solemn hour in the history of India, when British and Indian statesmen are laying the foundations of a federal constitution for that land, we address this appeal to you in the name of our common heritage on behalf of our 30 million Muslim brethren who live in Pakistan. This was later changed to Pakistan, by which we mean the five northern units of India, Punjab, the Northwest Frontier Province, Afghan, the A in Pakistan, Kashmir, Sindh, and Baluchistan, forming the Stan in Pakistan. For your sympathy and support in our grim and fateful struggle against political crucifixion and our complete annihilation. Our brave but voiceless nation is being sacrificed on the altar of Hindu nationalism, not only by non-Muslims, but the lasting disgrace of Islam by our own so-called leaders with reckless disregard to our future and in utter contempt of the teachings of history. The Indian Muslim delegation at the Roundtable Conference have committed an inexcusable and prodigious blunder. They have submitted in the name of Hindu nationalism to the perpetual subjugation of the ill-starred Muslim nation. These leaders have already agreed without any prospect or demur and without any reservation to a constitution based on the principle of an all India federation. This in essence amounts to nothing less than signing the death warrant of Islam and its future in India. In doing so, they have taken shelter behind the so-called mandate from the community. At this time, Ali's comments were controversial, but they would soon be realized within the next 15 years. Ali was at later pains to emphasize Pakistan's double meaning, for the second etymology trumps the acronym for a proposed territory for Pakistan. For Pakistan was conceived first as a religious community, and Pakistan, literally taken in Urdu and Persian, means land of the Pax, or the land of the pure, purity, religion, regeneration, the Islamic Renaissance. The proposed territory of Pakistan was thus a suggestion and not a commandment for the religious aspect, the non-territorial component of the nation came first. How then to determine whether a region was Pakistani or not? Ali had his own designs for a continental Muslim nation of Pakassia or Dinia, Dinia being an acronym of India. As you can see on this map on the left, Greater Pakistan included Gujarat, and this was simply the most cohesive of a series of national inventions, among them Bangistan, which would later be converted, I believe, into the much better sounding Bangladesh, in Bengal and Assam, which was based on the Curzon partition, and Osmanistan in Hyderabad. Given that Pakistan was a Muslim construct first, Pakistan's projected national territory represented India's Muslims in their majority constituencies. Ali's designs, however, go much further than this, allotting both Muslim majority states and princely states with Muslim Rajas, like the Nawab of Hyderabad, and Hindu majority states, such as Assam, to his Dinia. Realistically, it followed that only Muslim majority states could comprise Pakistan, even though Muslims represented a significant minority throughout most of India. Among the majority Muslim states, there was the province of Bengal, which posed two problems for a possible Islamic nation. The first, the implications of a non-contingent state surrounded by a potentially hostile India. These fears were realized when Pakistani Bengal, or East Pakistan, with Indian support, achieved its independence as Bangladesh in 1970. The more instances of isolated pocket provinces, the less viable the nation, as represented in Ali's Dinia to an almost comical degree. The second problem was the question of territorial integrity of the provinces of British India. Post-independence. As Pakistani nationalists were intent on territorial revisionism regarding India as a whole, why should Indian nationalists accept the inviolability of provinces with sizable Hindu and Sikh populations, such as Punjab, given that the provinces were themselves colonial contrivances? Sindh, for example, an overwhelmingly Muslim-majority state, had only been recently detached from the overwhelmingly Hindu Bombay presidency in 1936 as a response to the demands of the All-Muslim League. A policy of territorial revisionism, read really the provinces, was adopted by the British themselves with the Radcliffe Line, as you can see on the left, that demarcated the partition of the subcontinent and various provinces, notably Bengal and Punjab. Left with the rump of what will become modern Pakistan, with Bengal having broken away, 
Punjab having been partitioned and Kashmir a disputed territory, there remains a heterogeneous country divided into four principal regions. We see this regional contrast with the national amalgamation linguistically. Though the, through the Urdu language, Urdu has its origins in Uttar Pradesh, India, not Pakistan, which is understandable given the region was the center of India's Islamic empires and thus became the vehicle for the Islamic literary movement and was championed by Syed Ahmed Khan. Consider today that India has far more native Urdu speakers than Pakistan, some 50 million versus 10 million, whereas Pakistan has far more secondary speakers of Urdu, some 150 million or half of the total population of Pakistan. Urdu is the preferred language of Khan and Iqbal can thus be described as a pure lingua franca and a literary language for Pakistan, as opposed to a vernacular which had exists in India, while Pakistan has its own regional vernaculars in Punjabi, Sindhi, Pashto and Saraiki. Within the diversity of Pakistan, there are also competing particularisms, whether it be regional separatism encapsulated by Pashtunistan, which is the unification of the Pashtun peoples with a significant Pashto population in Afghanistan. So it's both a separatist movement and a attempt at a new national amalgamation or religious separatism, as with the Sikhs in both India and in Pakistan, with the conception of Halistan. In search of an imperfect precedent, I am drawn to the Soviet policy of colonization, literally to put down roots of the various nationalities of the constituent Soviet republics, a policy implemented only a decade prior to Juthari Ramaz Ali's coining of Pakistan. Per the policy, the non-Russian republics, most notably Ukraine, was defined as a specific territory, and within that territory, everyone, regardless of ethnicity, was to learn Ukrainian. Thus, what was presented as a nativist scheme was a reality imposed from above. Such a comparison, however, ignores the Islamic Ummah or community at the foundation of the nation, although one can draw some incredibly tenuous connection with Marxism, Leninism representing some form of religious centralism to the idea of colonization or Marxist internationalism that is going off in a different tangent. Pakistan's invention was as much reactionary, the defense of what Ali called an ancient Islamic heritage and what Iqbal was referring to as a Islamic restoration, as it was revolutionary. Pakistan as Janos with two faces, one looking to the past and one to the future. From inventing Pakistan, we turn to the necessity and the achievement of Pakistan and the pivotal role and the centrality of Muhammad Ali Jinnah. And here I'm going to be reading from an article by Sikandar Hayat, the charismatic leader and the achievement of Pakistan. Formulated by Max Weber and developed by a host of modern writers, charisma is most frequently used concept of political leadership. According to Wilner, the most authoritative writer, a charismatic leader, emerged in a, in a situation characterized by extreme social stress or crisis, often producing major deprivations. The given rulers seemed unwilling or unable to cope with or alleviate distress. The result was that people got alienated from the political system and thus became susceptible to the political appeal of a strong leader who could be seen as the symbol and the means of a rescue from distress. They saw the leader as somehow supernatural or extraordinary. This, uh, this uh, perception was not necessarily directly related to any one particular factor. The followers developed a generalized or undifferentiated notion of the extraordinary power of capability for their leaders. However, on the whole, the charismatic leaders demonstrated three qualities, supreme self-confidence or self-assurance, self-control, and a sense of mission. In the case of colonial societies in particular, the appeal of a charismatic level, a leader was at two levels. The first level related to the grievances and special interests of the distressed community, operating in opposition to the colonial rule. The second and the deeper level pertain to the charismatic leader's efforts to represent to his followers a sense of continuity between himself and his mission and their legendary heroes. 
In the light of the foregoing, it is obvious that Wilner indicated two sets of factors necessary to explain charisma and charismatic leadership, personal or personality factors and situational factors. So let us apply them to the case of the Qayyad i Azam, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, to ascertain how far he could be described as a charismatic leader. Since it is agreed among all writers on the subject, including Wilner, that the situation sets the stage for the emergence of a charismatic leader, it will be appropriate to begin with the situational factors. The Indian Muslims were confronted with a grave situation by the end of the 1930s. The experience of the Congress miniseries in 1937-39, rejecting the Muslims' offer of coalition, ignoring or brushing aside Muslim and Lee complaints, had created a genuine feeling of insecurity. This was all the more distressful in view of the fact that Jinnah and the Muslim League had fought the 1937 election on a conciliatory note. Jinnah had emphasized during the campaign that there were no fundamental differences between the League and the Congress, and for obvious reason. There could not be any self-respecting Indian who favored foreign domination or did not desire complete freedom and self-government for his country. In addition, the League had secured more Muslim seats than the Congress. It won 109 out of the 482 seats. The Congress bagged only 26 seats, 19 of them in the northwest frontier province, due to Khan Abdul Ghaffir Khan and his Kudai Kidmat Gaz. It's interesting with um, Khan Abdul Ghaffir Khan, who I've mentioned before as Basha Khan, he went on different names, later became an advocate for Pashtunistan or Pashto separatism, which of course is represented in the so called Afghan problems. Apparently, the Congress did not care much about the League or the Muslim sentiment associated with it, as India seemed to move closer to self government and independence. The Congress had assumed the mantle of national authority in order to prove its claim to be the successor to the British Raj. This was most dramatically evident in Nehru's statement of January 1937, claiming that there were only two parties in India, the British government and the Congress, and the others must line up. There was no communal problem in India. The Congress represented both Hindus and Muslims and other minorities. But if there was a problem at all, it could be sorted out after India had attained independence. The Muslims had insisted all along that Hindu, a Hindu Muslim settlement should come before independence. As early as 1924, Jinnah had warned the domination of the bureaucracy will continue as long as the Hindus and Mohammedans do not come to a settlement. Two decades later, after the Lahore resolution was adopted, Jinnah was still saying, as he told to Gandhi on September the 11th, 1944, in order to achieve the freedom and independence of the people of India, it is essential in the first instance that there should be a Hindu Muslim settlement. Anything else, he stressed, will be putting the cart before the horse and is generally opposed to the policy of declarations of the All India Muslim League. The prospect of self government had brought to the fore a decision of political power and spoils of office. Between the Hindus and the Muslims, the result was a constitutional crisis with all the stresses and strains on the body politic. Its ultimate test came with the Act of 1935, the most significant constitutional advance in India. The Act promoted a federation with a strong unitary bias. It empowered the centre to legislate the federal and also the concurrent list of subjects if so desired. In addition, the Act gave very little ultimately to the provinces. Worse still, if the Act proposed a unitary system of government in theory, the Congress, in its two and a half years of rule in the provinces, left no doubt about it in practice. Not only it rejected the League's advances at coalition making, but also showed to the Muslims that the rule of the majority meant Congress rule, exerted from a center dominated by the Hindu majority for an organization which brooked no opposition and refused to share its power. So the idea here is that though the Act of 1935, the constitutional arrangement which empowered the provinces, you can see the provinces on the list, on the list here on the right, nominally gave India a federal constitution or a weak center in the way that the Congress was able to trump uh, the League in terms of its organization and power and its ability to coordinate between the provinces, the weak center was in fact transformed into the strong center and the League was powerless to react to this. The Muslims were not prepared to submit to a central government dominated by the Hindu majority community. They knew that they were a minority and a permanent one. 
Thus, the more they saw powers vested in the centre, the more they feared that they must necessarily favour the Hindus. In the end, Jinnah was constrained to condemn the very system of representative government itself. The system, he charged, had definitely resulted in a permanent communal majority government ruling over the minorities, exercising its powers and functions, and utilising the machinery of government to establish the domination and supremacy of the majority communal rule over the minorities. And again, this emphasizes the fact that albeit Jinnah very reluctantly came to this view, because in contrast to Iqbal and in contrast to Khan, Jinnah, you could say, began as an independence advocate and only became a Muslim separatist as a result of necessity, where these two figures already understood the damage or the threat that representative institutions and multi-confessional democracy, where Muslims represented a minority and what that meant and how they acted as a threat against the Muslim nation. These feelings and fears became all the more profound with the knowledge, especially in the wake of World War II, that the British were on their way out. They will be left at the mercy of the Hindu majority government. This was the herald of a crisis in which the Muslims, having lost power to the British, were not confronted with the possibility of losing it permanently to the Hindus. In Jinnah's own words, they were caught between the devil and the deep sea. The situation was very distressful. Jinnah was in national, con national politics since 1906, when he attended the Calcutta session of the Congress under the presiden uh, presidentship of, the, of Dada Bahai Naroji, who was the um, liberal MP in parliament or the unofficial um, ambassador to India. He had received his first need for general recognition from the Muslims in 1913 in recognition of his tireless efforts in successfully piloting um, the Waf al Ulad bill, a matter of great concern to the community. He was the chief architect of the Lucknow Pact of 1916, the only time Congress was to concede the Muslims their demand for separate electorates. He was the main formulator of the Muslim interests in his 14 points, which remained the Muslim creed for a long time. He dominated the Muslim League from 1916 to 30. He remained its president for a number of years, and yet he was not the leader of the Muslims. It was only when they were caught between the devil and the deep sea that is the dis and that is the discredited present and their alarming future, that they turned to him, recognized him as their undisputed leader, and urged him to lead them out of their distressful situation. This transformation in Jinnah's political fortunes really started with the Lucknow session of the Muslim League in 1937. Attended by a host of Muslim leaders, including Hayat Khan and Fazl Haik, and Sir Mohammed Sadullah, Premier of the Punjab and Beng Bengal and Assam, respectively, the session saw probably the first indication of the growing sense of solidarity among the Muslims of India. It also represented the first breakthrough in the League's effort to mobilize public support at the grassroots level. But more importantly, the Lucknow session reflected a radical shift in Jinnah's own political thinking. He had moved far from his classical position in politics. There was no longer any confusion in his mind as to the aims of Congress or the possible fate of the Muslims in a polity dominated by the Hindu majority community. The majority, he pointed out, can assume a non-communal label, but it can no way prevent it from, from but can no way prevent it from remaining. Exclusively Hindu in its spirit and action. In addition, Jinnah was now convinced that the Western system of democracy, without the qualifications and limitations to which the system must be subjugated, was not su suitable for Muslims. India's constitutional and political problems required a new solution. There was indeed a finally decisive period in Jinnah's political transformation. Henceforth, he was to commit himself to building a future for the Muslims in which neither the British nor the Congress would be arbiters of their destiny, but rather they themselves. Prior to 1937, he was, by and large, engaged in the task of mobilizing the support of the Congress or the British to the Muslim cause. Now he refused to seek favors from either the Congress or the British. He wanted the Muslims to organize themselves, develop their own resources and strength, and not submit to either of the two parties. Let me tell you, and I tell both of you, that you alone or both combined will never succeed in destroying our souls. You will never be able to destroy that culture which we have inherited. You may overpower us. You can do your worst. But we have come to the conclusion, and we have now made a grim resolve, 
that we shall go down. If we have to go down, it will be fighting. The Muslims saw in this resolve, this grim resolve, a true reflection of their aspiration, hopes and fears. They flocked to him, declared him their man of the moment, their saviour, and indeed surrounded him with the honorific title of Qayyid i Azam, the great leader. In large part, as suggested earlier, this change in Jannah's fortunes was due to the changed situation of Muslim India. But it was by no means an inevitable change. The Muslims had made a well-considered decision to entrust leadership to a man who was more qualified than anyone else to lead them for the kind of challenges and difficulties they were confronted with. Very briefly, some of these qualities may be summarized here. First, Jinnah was a man absolutely sure of himself and his cause. R.G. Casey, governor of Bengal, for instance, felt that Jinnah was not only sure of himself, but I would believe that it does not occur to him that he may be wrong. Again, one, one of his colleagues in the legal profession who knew him well asserted Jinnah's faith in himself was incredible. Secondly, Jinnah not only could respond to the Muslim aspirations, but was also the only leader of his time who knew how to express the stirrings of the mind in the form of concrete propositions. This also explained why the opponents of Pakistan's demand were hard put to presenting an alternate program. And indeed, some of them had no choice but to swear by Pakistan as a goal in public, at least. Thirdly, Jinnah, as a constitutionalist, was best suited for the task of negotiating with the Congress and the British for the interests of the Muslims in the future constitution of India. He seemed to be cut out for the constitutional role from the very start. He had faithfully imbibed the constitutionalism of his political mentors like Naroji, Gokhali and Mehta, and was generally convinced that constitutional struggle was the only possible way to free India. Fourthly, Jinnah had a logical and methodical mind, the ability to see things through realism and pragmatism, to be able to see things as they are. But this did not mean that he was devoid of passions. He was a passionate man, and in his opinion of his biography, of uh, biographer Hector Bull, um, Bolitho, in the end, he was to hasten his own death in a cause to which he gave his will and logic, as passionately as Gandhi led his disciples with zeal and intuition. Finally, Jinnah was a more astute leader than many of his contemporaries, including the British. He knew when to take the tide and when to make suitable mends in the furnace of reality and expediency. He never lost touch with the realities of a given situation, no matter how difficult or demanding. He often made the right decision and quickly, adjusted to change situations, past failures had instructed him. These and many other questions which crystallized with the years and which he demonstrated in abundance were buttressed by the Muslims' belief, shared even by those who did not approve of his demand for Pakistan, that he had no personal axe to grind. Dr. Syed Hussein, for instance, noted, though I'm opposed to Pakistan, I must say that Mr. Jinnah is the only man in public life whose public record is most incorruptible. The Muslim masses know that Mr. Jinnah is the only man who is not in need of money and who has no lust for power. But then, it was not enough to be the most qualified man to lead Muslim India. Jinnah also had to show them a way out. The way Jinnah's mind was moving was indicated not only in the article he wrote in Time and Tide in London in January of 1940, suggesting that Muslims and Hindus were separate nations, but also discernible in several other statements. The major thrust of these statements was to emphasize the separatist Muslim thinking from Syed Ahmed Khan to Alam Muhammad Iqbal. Sir Iqbal in particular, in his letters of 1936-37, had articulated and forcefully communicated to Jinnah the rationale for a redistribution of the country on the lines of social, religious and linguistic affinities. Jinnah was convinced and willing to demand this redistribution by asserting the Muslim right of self-determination as the only solution of the Muslim problem in India. On March the 22nd, 1940, Jinnah announced formally the Muslim claim for nationhood, along with a separate homeland in his presidential address at the Lahore session of the Muslim League, attended by about 100,000 Muslims from all parts and provinces of India, the largest Muslim, Muslim gathering so far. Muslims, India, he declared, cannot accept any constitution which must necessarily result in a Hindu majority government. Indeed, he went on to claim that the Muslims are a nation, 
according to any definition of a nation, and like any other free nation, were entitled to a separate homeland to develop to their fullest their spiritual, cultural, economic, social, and political life. The problem in India, he insisted, is manifestly an internal one, and it must be treated as such. He therefore suggested that the only course open to us is to allow the major nations separate homelands by dividing India into autonomous national states. The League fully endorsed Jinnah's viewpoint. On March the 24th, resolved that areas in which the Muslims are numerically a majority in the northwest and eastern zones of India should be grouped to constitute independent states. Pakistan and the idea of one Muslim state of Pakistan was to evolve subsequently through greater political mobilization and support of the Muslims. Jinnah's support stipulated in the Lahore resolution, taking apart the old world and putting together a new bold one had an irresistible appeal for Muslims. Facing agony and frustration at the hands of the Hindu majority community, the promise of their own separate homeland not only provided them a reassuring anchor in a climate of turbulence and uncertainty, but also gave them a sense of purpose and worth, which they were fast losing as India advanced towards self-government and independence. The idea also came to offer them an opportunity to work for the regeneration of Islam that, so that its values could be re-expressed with new concrete achievements. It soon became the symbol of their nationalism and their ultimate demand and goal. Jinnah, however, could not remain content merely with a popular upsurge. He had to channelize these feelings and emotions of the Muslims into an organized platform. He had to reorganize the Muslim League to force the British and the Congress to concede the demand for Pakistan. In order to reorganize the Muslim League, Jinnah planned a strategy based on four major moves. These moves, of course, did not necessarily flow one after the another, rather they operated simultaneously, reinforcing and revitalizing one another. First, Jinnah expanded the League in a way that it could make room for new social groups, particularly those who were moved by the Pakistan idea and thus were keen to join it and serve its cause. He gave the League a new organizational setup. The Constitution of 1940 provided for the grassroots level participation, leading all the way up to the Working Committee, Council of the League, and the office of the President, who was to be elected every year by the Council from amongst the nominees of the different branches of the League. The result of this carefully expanded structure was to open up new avenues of association and participation within the League, attracting a host of Muslim social groups and interests. The most enthusiastic response, of course, came from the educated urban middle class who perceived it clearly that the so-called Indian nationalism was primarily Hindu nationalism. They were also well aware that economic life in India was largely dominated by the Hindus. Thus, they did not take long to realize the only way they could secure their particular interest was to join the League and work for Pakistan, where they will have immense opportunities for development. Their support to the League not only assured a greater dispersion of power within the League, but also provided Jinnah the much needed strength to keep the traditional groups, such as the big landlords in check. The result of the coming together of the newly mobilized groups in the League also was to transform it into a genuine nationalist movement, representing all the major groups of Muslim society, both old, new, modern and traditional. Secondly, having gone through this expansion phase, Jinnah launched his next move, concentration of power into his own hands, to make the League a well-knit and disciplined organization. But this was not going to be an easy task. While he did not face much difficulty in dealing with these groups, he had joined the League for their own, who had joined the League for their own reasons. He found it considerably more disconcerting to discipline those elements who had joined the League more for tactical gains than out of any genuine conviction. He found it particularly hard to discipline the provincial leaders of the Punjab and Bengal. They were highly reluctant to yield to the control of the centre. But Jinnah kept the pressure first by entering into alliances with these leaders, as with the Unionists in the Punjab, and then appealing directly to the masses over the issue of Pakistan. The result was that by the year 1942, Sir Sikinda Hayat Khan was not only reluctant to stand up to Jinnah, but more importantly, was convinced but unless he walked wearily and kept on the right side of Jinnah, he would be swept away. His successor, Kizir Hayat Khan Tiwani, was routed in the 1946 election and was forced to hand over control of the Punjab to the League and Jinnah. 
Thirdly, Jinnah launched a political mobilization campaign to give the people at large a cause to identify with and thus render support to the League. Jinnah's appeal had two distinctive components. The first component was that of a special interest to the Muslims and one of opposition both to the rule of the British and the imminent threat of Hindu domination in the event of British withdrawal, withdrawal from India. The second component of Jinnah's appeal was that of Islam as a political and social goal for the Muslims of Pakistan. Islam, he emphasized, is not a set of rituals, traditions and spiritual doctrines. Islam is a code of life for every Muslim, which regulates his life and conduct. Jinnah's appeal was indeed a blend of traditionalism and modern norms, promoting on the one hand the modernist concept of nationhood and advancing the traditional all-embracing message of Islam and Muslim separatism on the other. The reconciliation of the two in the demand for Pakistan, a separate homeland, not only went on to win the support of Muslim masses, but also to encourage some of the more vulnerable groups of society, such as the educated urban middle class, to see it and profess it as, a primarily, as primarily their own call to duty. Educated students and women in particular went on to play a leading role in the League's civil disobedience movement in the Punjab, the cornerstone of a would-be Pakistan. Again, emphasizing this idea of Pakistan as Janus with two faces, looking to the past and also fundamentally modern. Finally, Jinnah made most of his efforts to consolidate Muslim India under the banner of the League by taking full advantage of the opportunities provided by the Congress and the British during World War II. The Congress provided him with the first and the most momentous opportunity by resigning its ministries in reaction to the decision of the British government in 1939 to declare war on behalf of India and thus left the field entirely to the Muslim League. Jinnah went on to install League ministries in its place, especially in the Muslim majority provinces of Assam, Sindh, Bengal and the northwest frontier province. The League had already an alliance with the Unionists in the Punjab. Thus Jinnah came to have League ministries in virtually all the Muslim majority provinces, including Pakistan. This had important implications for the League. There was no turning away from the League and Jinnah in the years to come. The war itself provided Jinnah an ideal opportunity to get most out of the British government. In view of the Congress attitude, the British were virtually left with no choice but to woo the non-Congress parties, and especially the League first. The League was a major party, second only to the Congress at the All India level. Secondly, the League represented Muslims who, though a minority in the country, contributed immensely to the Indian army, a fact readily recognized by responsible British authorities both in India and in Britain. Thus, the British desperately needed the League. One indicator of this was the Declaration of August 8th, 1940, whereby the British government was constrained to state publicly that they could not contemplate the transfer of the present responsibilities for the peace and welfare of India to any system of government whose authority is directly denied by a large and powerful element in India's national life. This was perhaps one of the greatest triumphs that Jinnah had achieved through his brilliant strategy during the war years. This and other triumphs helped the League emerge as the sole representative body of Muslim India. In the 1945 and 1946 provincial elections, the League was able to secure 460 of the 533 Muslim seats in the central and provincial assembly elections, 86% of the seats. In terms of the votes polled, the League was able to manage 86.7% of the total Muslim vote cast in the Central Assembly and 75% in the Provincial Assemblies. This was a remarkable achievement over the 4.4% it had polled in the 1937 elections. But obviously, organisation of the Muslims under the banner of the League was the fulfilment of half of Jinnah's mission. He had to deal with the British and the Congress to achieve Pakistan. Just sending out a reminder, just give me a second. Jinnah launched his efforts for, his achieve, for the achievement of Pakistan by emphasizing three points in particular. Pakistan was the only solution of the Hindu-Muslim problem in India. The Muslim League was the sole representative body of Muslim India, 
and the League will not enter into any negotiations on constitutional advance unless the British conceded the demand for Pakistan first. An essential corollary of the last condition was an additional demand that the League could enter interim government at the centre only if it was given parity with the Congress. Jinnah found the war conditions particularly helpful. The August direct, uh, 8th direct declaration had already helped him, although he rejected the declaration on the ground that it did not ensure the Muslims their real voice and share in the government of the country. The die was cast. Henceforth, no move could be made at the centre without Jinnah influencing the outcome. The Crips mission, the Simla conference and the cabinet mission merely went on to confirm the now unassailable position of Jinnah and the League. Cripps conceded that if any province of British India was not prepared to accept the new constitution or the present constitutional position, the British government will be prepared to grant such non-acceding provinces the same status as that of the All Indian Union. Again, the Simla conference, first political conference of all the major political parties after the end of the war in Europe, could not force Jinnah to accept anything less than parity and the exclusive right to nominate Muslim members to the Viceroy's expanded executive council. Jinnah could not agree to put, Pakistan, to put the Pakistan issue in cold storage indefinitely. Earlier in his talks with Gandhi in September 1944, Jinnah had specifically asked him to accept the fundamentals of the Lahore Resolution and proceed to settle the details. Since the end of the war, one could clearly discern the efforts on the part of the British government to lessen and to possibly eradicate the psychological fear of the Muslims in India by encouraging not Jinnah's crude Pakistan, but a modified concept, concept of Pakistan, a concept resent, uh, resting essentially on federal principles, more likely to lead to a unified India. The result was the cabinet mission plan, offering Muslims a choice between Jinnah's sovereign Pakistan restricted to Muslim majority areas and a larger Pakistan, which will come into a central federal nexus. Cripps personally told Jinnah that we could not press Congress to accept anything more than we might call a smaller Pakistan. Jinnah was confronted with the most difficult test of his political life because the decision I was called upon to make, he told Isfahani, would make or mar the destiny of our nation. And again, this is the ultimate resolution of the conflict between an ambiguous sense of it. Muslim autonomy or total Muslim separatism and sovereignty. After much deliberation and thought, Jinnah accepted the mission plan in the belief that the foundation and the basis of Pakistan were there. The Muslims had to wait for some time, 10 years, till the Union constitutions so devised failed. But being a constitution himself, Jinnah was convinced that the proposed constitution could not work. To begin with, it was not clear how the Union will raise finances for the subjects given to the centre foreign affairs, defense and communication. It was equally not clear how the executive and the legislature will resolve questions of communal nature, i.e. Hindu-Muslim relations. In fact, for all practical purposes, the plan was too cumbersome, out of touch with the realities of the Hindu-Muslim politics and thus difficult to work. But then Jinnah also knew that same proposals, that some proposals in the plan, such as the grouping clause, which formed the crux of the matter, were not acceptable to the Congress. Gandhi made it absolutely clear right from the outset in his article in Halajan that there was no take it or leave it business about their recommendation. If there were restrictions, the Constituent Assembly would be a sovereign body free to frame a constitution of, of an independent India. On May the 20th, the Congress Working Committee passed a resolution reiterating its own interpretation on the grouping of provinces. To the utter dismay and disappointment of Jinnah, the cabinet mission did not challenge their conditional acceptance of the plan, and in fact invited the Congress to form the interim government. Jinnah protested, but in vain. He could not believe that the British had gone back on their plighted word and called on the League to act. On July the 29th, 1946, the League rejected the cabinet mission plan and resolved that now the time had come for the Muslim nation to resort to direct action to achieve Pakistan. This marked virtually the end of any prospect of a united India in the ensuing struggle for transfer of power to Indian hands. The modified concept of Pakistan was buried forever. Muslims and Hindus had to come to part like never before. India saw a spate of communal violence in various parts of the country. Jinnah refused to attend the proposed constituent assembly in spite of the fact 
that he had eventually agreed to join the interim government at the centre. But it was no more to wreck from within. Jinnah was not to spare any effort to undermine the British Congress concept or the future constitution of India. In the end, he created the situation where partition of India emerged as an inevitable alternative to civil war and bloodshed. On June the 3rd, 1947, the British government announced the partition, and on August the 14th, 1947, Jinnah achieved Pakistan as an independent state for the Muslims. The new nation state of Pakistan received Jinnah with adulation, amounting almost to worship. On August the 15th, he was sworn in as the first Governor General of Pakistan, with the official title of Qaid i Azam. This was indeed the pinnacle of his career as the undisputed leader of Indian Muslims. In the words of one of his followers and disciples, he was a man who with the singleness of purpose, his unbending will and complete faith in his righteousness and the righteousness of his cause, created a nation with life and vision out of an exhausted, disarrayed and frustrated people. What does Pakistan represent other than an inescapable logic. While the concept of a Muslim nation in India, or Ummah, was identified by Syed Ahmad Khan, Khan believed that such a nation, a nation that defied territorial categorization, was best served under British paramountcy, which in some respects represented a continuation of the Mughal Empire and the Delhi Sultanate. The notion of a nation within a nation was contingent on the preservation of a weak center. Muslim nationalism thus represented at first a centrifugal rather than separatist force in Indian politics. As a consequence of, Indian, of the Indian independence movement and the program of the Indian National Congress, the possibility of an enduring weak center or a federal India receded in favor of a democratic unitary state, ostensibly secular, though dominated by a Hindu majority. As this democratic and centralizing agenda ran roughshod over the concerns of the Muslim League, federalism was superseded by separatism. Pakistan represented a prospective territory for a nation never before conceived in terms of physical borders. As a concept, Pakistan was unambiguous, trumping previous vague and unviable solutions for autonomy, looming independence, and Congress implacability gave an impetus to Pakistan, a sense of urgency, galvanizing the support of India's Muslims under the charismatic leadership of Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Pakistan was an invention, but it was an invention born of necessity. All right, thank you everyone very much for listening. Um, so yes, uh, I, I've sent this little message. If any audience members have any questions to put to me, remember to leave a comment to preface with at Apostolic Majesty. And again, if you wish to guarantee that I'll answer your question, um, send a super chat. My plan is with these, uh, to do them for about two hours. So uh, you have me for the next uh, 23 minutes, unless uh, there isn't a flurry of questions in which uh, I will I'll end this prematurely. So um, the first question I get before I get onto the super chats. At Apostolic Majesty, so Jinnah wanted to tighten control in Pakistan, but to loosen, by this point, independence, Indian control. Was Pakistan independence achieved in the non-violent way like India? Well, what do you mean by that? Um, Jinnah centralized control in the party to make it a viable organizational unit which could force the Pakistani issue first as a federal union and ultimately when faced with the implacability of the Congress as a sovereign nation, albeit Jinnah reluctantly came to that position given the fact that uh, uh, Chudri uh, Ahmad Ali had already proposed this idea much earlier. Um, was Pakistan independence achieved in the non-violent way like India? You'll have to sort of that doesn't really make any sense to me. I'll have to sort of uh, uh, rephrase that if that's possible. Thank you. Uh, syntax error, uh, Apostolic Majesty. Is Pakistan a composite name representing the different regions uh, or does its etymology refer to something else? Well, yes, as I referred to earlier in the lecture, there is a dual etymology. Pakistan 
does re- it, it was conceived first as one of many national designs, as well as Bangistan, Osmanistan, Pak, uh, Pakassia, Dinia, etc. And it is, as you say, Panjab, Afghani, Kashmir, Stan. However, this like it, it's fun to play around with, but it should serve as a secondary etymology, because. Ali, as well as all the leaders and the official ideology of Pakistan, recognizes it's the land of the pure first. So it's supposed to represent this idea that Islam is an Islamic nation before representing a mere amalgamation of provinces. Indeed, if you look at Pakistan when it was originally formed in 1947 with the Radcliffe Line, I'll just get the map up to explain this point, it didn't even encompass the entirety of these territories. Punjab was partitioned and Kashmir, as a result of partition, actually acceded to India and sparked off a series of wars. And it also included Bengal, which became East Pakistan, which further complicates this idea of a amalgamation of Muslim states on the northwestern frontier. Um, so this is where you get into the more sort of uh, fantastical ideas you can see on the map here on the left of Dinia or all of these proposed sort of uh, greater Islamic states within a, uh, you can say a dual Islamic nation and a Hindu nation. But of course, this idea was floated around ambiguously and suggested as preferable to separatism. But as the Congress was determined that they would frame their own constitution post-independence and wouldn't guarantee a constitutional settlement before the British left, which is what Jinnah wanted. And they, of course, reserved the right as a democratic country to revise, revise the constitution as they wished. Jinnah believed he had no fundamental fundamental protections and that the only answer, of course, was separatism. And in the end, uh, Pakistan was significantly smaller than any of these sort of proposals or projections, especially when we have the Pakistan, the uh, East Bengali sort of revolution and they're becoming Bangladesh. Right. Absolute Majesty John, not real name. Uh, what, how late was Pakistan meant to be independent? Meant Gandhi is noted for his nonviolence, but how was it related to Pakistan? Oh, this is the thing. Jinnah and Gandhi worked together as members of the Indian National Congress. And you could actually argue that uh, Jinnah was less radical than Gandhi in this sense, because Gandhi advocated agitation, albeit through the idea of the truth force or non-violent civil disobedience or resistance, basically to bring British India to a halt as the entire country would simply ceased to work. Um, Jinnah, however, believed in extended negotiations and constitutional agitation. He was a lawyer first and foremost, and so he believed that this situation had to be worked out through the legal system of India. Uh, so their entire way of going about this was fundamentally different. And indeed, you can say it is his constitutional acumen, which realizes the idea that if a constitutional status for a Pakistani government or a Pakistani federal unit within a all union, an, an all India union could not be guaranteed, then a constitutional settlement would never be backed up by, you know, good faith or real power. And so it had to be a separatism. Right seeing a flurry of questions, but um, not aimed at me. Uh, so so again, I will I sort of re-repeat my, my, my sort of uh, call for, uh, for questions. I understand it's quite a, an out there topic um, in terms of, you know, where this came about exactly, um, you know, why did I d- decide to discuss Pakistan? I hope I've justified um, discussing Pakistan tonight. All right, um, I'll wait for a couple more questions to come in. In the meantime, I'll read the the couple of super chats that have come in. Right. DC for £10. Thank you very much. Uh, You must have read my mind. I was just digging into this period of which I know nothing. Uh, Would it be possible to cover Bangladesh in a similar lecture? Um, I very much doubt it partly because so much of Bangladesh as East Pakistan sort of covers this whole whole point. And um, like I said, this idea of Muslim nationalism versus Indian nationalism encompasses Bengal. And the, the Bangladesh situation is, you can say, it represents a more interesting question, which I think is less the conception of Bangladesh as a nation than asking a very provocative question, which is, has Pakistan being a failure? 
I think is the more is the more provocative question to ask. Another question to ask would be to focus on the Indian Muslim wars. Sorry, the Indian Pakistani wars, which obviously facilitated the independence of Bangladesh. So there are there are other, I'd say, more interesting angles or discussions to have around that topic rather than focusing um specifically on Bangladeshi independence. Right. Okay. Um, Chris Seymour, thank you. But as with all of these things, do preface with at apostolic majesty. So I, I know you're, you're talking to me. Um, is there anything left of the Mughal aristocracy? Yes, but they were disempowered um, after and ceased to become a real viable faction. Interesting enough, the Nawabs of Hyderabad were actually Mughal vassals who came to power as a result of um, Aurangzeb's campaigns in the Deccan. And of course, Hyderabad used to be the uh, the city of Golconda. It used to be a, a major sort of a, a kingdom in the south, and it became a uh, a power base for a, a Muslim general from the Mughal dynasty. And the Nawab of Hyderabad on the cusp of independence was by far the most powerful of the Indian princes. Right. Amish Verma, if you had to give a time frame or era, when do you think Hindu India becomes an independent nation instead of a collection of ethnicities? If you had to give a time frame or era, what do you think? When do you think Hindu era became an independent? This is the thing. I, I still don't believe that that question has been answered. And, you know, in part, history is an evaluation of the process of national becoming in the case of what I'm interested in. And in the case, the idea of nationalism is always in a state of flux. Um, I still believe that question is being asked at the moment and there are various answers to it. And I believe that the diminishing of the Congress in India is representative of, you can say, the failure of that original vision of the secular nationalism as opposed to Hindu, as opposed to Hindu nationalism. And of course, the irony of Pakistan is that you create Pakistan in response to a perceived Hindu nationalism, or rather, you can say, a acceptance of the inevitability of a Hindu nationalism in a democratic in a democratic makeup. And of course, all that does, once you've created the separatist state, which is based on Islamic principles, is you spur on Hindu nationalism in response to that. So the Indian independence movement and the effects of partition have had fundamental sort of effects and implications for a perception of Indian nationalism. But in, in terms of like an era, as I've mentioned in this lecture before, the British Muslim states were the dominant states in India for 600 years. So you have to sort of, in terms of sort of going back to a, a Hindu precedent for India, I mean, do you go to the, the Chola empire or the Gupta empire and to what extent did those empires, you know, represent anything as in tandem as some form of Indian sort of super identity? Um, it's complicated to say the least, right? Uh, Faith Knight for $20, thank you very much. To what degree, if any, did prior British experience with partitioning the Ottoman Empire influence the drawing of geopolitical entities for Pakistan and India in 1947? What motivations did the Radcliffe Commission have? Okay, right. Regarding the motivations for the Radcliffe Commission, when I was originally writing this up, I wanted to dedicate a large amount of this conversation to partition. But as I mentioned in my introduction, I don't believe that was the correct thing to do because partition has to be analyzed from the Indian, the Pakistani and the British point of view, and indeed just international opinion in general, including the Soviets and the Americans. And funneling it into this conversation about Pakistan would make it a rather myopic discussion in my view to add partition in any sort of serious depth as part of this conversation or as a tag on. So I want to discuss the motivations of the Radcliffe Commission and you know, the accusations against Mountbatten, et cetera, and the, the various controversial um, uh, territorial 
allocations as a result of the Radcliffe Commission. And you can say the fermenting of what would later be the Kashmiri conflict. All of these things are interesting, but I'm going to try and save it for a future conversation. As the idea of the Ottoman Empire's partition influencing Pakistan and India, um, I mean, <laughs> it's interesting to sort of you bring that up because the British experience of partitioning the Ottoman Empire was almost a total failure. Um, the British attempted with the French and the Italians to partition the Ottoman Empire to give Armenia um, a significant state in the West, which would have access to the sea, um, to give basically Britain control over the Straits, to give Italy control over Lycia, and to give Greece control of Smyr um, Smyrna and potentially a sort of foothold up to Constantinople itself. And all of this was undone. Whereas, you know, with the Radcliffe line, you can say that, you know, even if it was controversial, even if it was hated, even if it created civil conflicts and spawned wars, um, by and large, the Radcliffe line has remained. I mean, it's actually incredible because I, I would like to talk about this in more depth. If you look at the Radcliffe line, especially regarding the Bengal partition and you just look at the complete mess of the border there it's incredible that these borders have remained constant over the last you know 75 years it really is rather remarkable um but as a result of ottoman partitioning like i said i brought up two more relevant partitions earlier which was the case of northern ireland and the UN-sponsored partition in the British Mandate of Palestine, which created Israel and Palestine. Um, but like I said, that, that that is more of sort of an interesting question for a um, a future topic expressly dedicated to partition. Uh, Polish ambassador for twenty five Polish lottery. Thank you. Uh, hey hey, are there any territorial disputes lingering to this day? Nationalist grievances. Did powers play those two again? each other against each other during the cold war uh the uh, assuming you're talking about pakistan the answer is yes yes and yes <laughs> very very uh, very briefly um yes there are territorial disputes i mean i mentioned kashmir is the most obvious territory dispute and uh, like i said you can see it on the map the gray of course it was a uh, a princely state uh, a Muslim majority state under a Hindu Raja who was pressured into acceding to India after responses to uh, uh, a Pakistani sort of tribal invasion. So yes, the the Kashmir conflict has never been resolved successfully. And recently there was even a update from the Indian side in the constitutional arrangements of the so-called autonomous governing province of Kashmir. And it hasn't been resolved just to, to play that just to emphasize that and it's not just territorial disputes regarding pakistan and india either china has a vested interest in that region and has fought and did fight a war about 15 years after this point against nehru i think it was in 1962 uh in the arundel pradesh which is north of Assam, and in the ladakh and um, the cash and the area north of kashmir so yes this region is um is fundamental you can say and who essentially controls it exerts a huge amount of influence over the politics of um south asia so yes as for cold war well india would go on and become a leading member in the non-aligned movement it's effectively you know nehru and tito are the two big figures in that um later in dira gandhi um and pakistan would draw to the united states Quite reliably and has been seen as a quite stalwart united states ally however recently that's complicated with its relationship with china right okay so i'm just checking to see if any questions if they're not i'm going to call it a day for this evening i think um and this is an interesting question um not john not real name absolute majesty what was the push by nero for centralism his socialism it seems that that problem deeply hurt the communal ties i i would argue yes i mean nero did look to the soviet union as a model it's ironic because i bring up this idea of uh, colonization of seeding roots of indigenization the irony is that if nehru was so enamored with the soviet union that colonization could potentially prove as some sort of workaround whereby the 
democratic sort of India would be some form of amalgamation of different republics, because of course Nehru was very sort of determined to push through dominion status and achieve full sovereignty as an Indian republic. Um, but of course he didn't go for that option. He believed that Congress could fundamentally represent the needs of Muslims and Hindus and all other parties. And essentially it's it, it's down to this fundamental conception of multiculturalism, of eradicating differences between religious castes and re-emphasizing them. Are you going to form a bedrock of a nation based on a secular multicultural identity, or are you going to base it on religious particularism? And Jinnah, as we see, rather reluctantly comes to that view. But when he takes that view, he is able to execute it, which none of the more idealistic advocates for um, Islamic sort of nationalism, or in the case of uh, Chudri Rahmet Ali, explicit demand for Pakistan were able to achieve. Um, but yes, I do agree, it did hurt the problem. And I believed it is, I do believe it is the single reason why Pakistan exists. Um, I believe that because interesting because Gandhi and Nehru disagreed on this point Gandhi wanted to bring Jinnah in and make Jinnah the first prime minister of an independent India and Nehru of course detested that idea and he believed it was stupid because he knew that in any election he will be Jinnah will be out and Nehru would be in so the only way that Gandhi's compromise would work is the suspension of democratic representation. <laughs> so it's not just centralism, but it's the insistence on democracy. But there's also this idea, other idea of India being a great power. For Nehru, separating India, dividing and ruling India would um, only and um, would only compromise the potential of India to act as a great power. I think the irony is that Nehru could have probably been able to achieve total power for India as a united great power uh, if he had employed subterfuge, if he had been uh, less open about what he wanted to achieve and was able to, uh, you can say, act with duplicity towards the Congress, you know, bringing them in to this idea that they would be afforded some ambiguous notion of autonomy. And of course, Jinnah was kryptonite to that view because Jinnah insisted we are not going to abide by any ambiguous pretext of of regional sort of autonomy or these ostensible protections for Muslims. No, we want them guaranteed in writing before we become independent, and then they cannot be changed post-independence. And of course, Nehru, who believed that this was an independent struggle, believed the idea of being constrained by an agreement with the British in perpetuity was just absurd for an Indian nationalist. At Apostolic Majesty, does Pakistan endure without U.S. support? Well, U.S. support didn't guarantee that East Bengal remained with Pakistan during the 1970s. So clearly um, that isn't the case. And like I said, this will be an interesting question for you know, how successful is Pakistan. But I almost feel that I don't want to sort of uh, indulge this topic too much. Right. I think that is it. Um, that is it for this evening, I think. So thank you everyone for, for indulging me and uh, for getting through this rather complex and I can understand for many people um, for, uh, rather sort of new or novel topic. Um, but hopefully at least I have presented some new ideas. And I mean, again, another reason I was drawn to this is that I think everyone in the West is drawn to some form of revulsion of the idea of Pakistan because it does represent an antithesis of multiculturalism. So I was also drawn to the idea of focusing on Pakistan from the Pakistani perspective and finding that it was far more sort of nuanced and pragmatic than I could have ever imagined. And in that sense, as some form of, you know, some form of precedent who you can say regional and religious particularism i find pakistan rather fascinating that in the sense that pakistan's inception you could say was a direct response to the encroachment of democratic institutions um and syntax error has just sent a uh, a five dollar super chat um thank you for your lectures am thank you very much syntax error uh if possible 
uh, I long love a long form coverage of historical Japan Korea rivalry, especially with the uh, Imjin War of the 1590s. Well, yeah, I, I was planning on doing Japan, um, but I was focusing on the Edo period and the Meiji Restoration. So that's just just after. If I was going to include like the Japanese Korean rivalry, I mean, it would have to be a, some sort of extension of a conversation regarding uh, Zen Gobu Jidai. Um, or the era of the country at war, followed by, you, you can say that the energy behind Japan's civil war was refocused into a national conflict between Japan and Korea, so as to galvanize support and cement the rule of um, uh, Toyotomi Hideyoshi. Um, of course, it didn't go very well in both invasions, but I think that's it. So thank you very much, Syntax Era. All right. If you enjoyed this video please like and leave a comment it helps the channel a lot uh, to see more content like this subscribe to apostolic majesty if you want to support the channel and gain access to members only content please consider becoming a channel member thank you everyone for watching thank you everyone who uh sent a super chat it is very much appreciated and good night